and so you lose something. So let's, let's be very optimistic. For each device, you need 0.3 millimeters thick of, uh, of silicon, something. And that brings you then to 7 million tons per year of pure, rather pure silicon. I won't say it's impossible, but I tell you it's, it, is, it is a challenge. Um, oh, and then if you think about some kind of technology, which can be organic, but there are other thin film technologies, have, let's say organic. With organic, if we would have a 400 nanometer thick layer. I hope by now you know that that is really thick for an organic solar cell, and you don't really need that. But let's take 400 nanometer. Then that is 6,000 ton per year. And I don't know if you have an idea of 6,000 ton of an organic chemical, but I assure you that is called a fine chemical. That is not a bulk, big product. It's a fine chemical. That is nothing. It's really nothing. So with very small scale chemistry, we can go for a terawatt peak per year. It's really, really doable. So this is, of course, an important, uh, important uh, part of the story. And another thing is, as I said yesterday, availability, right? You have to use the elements that are available. So please don't make something based on tellurium or selenium. It's not a very good idea if you really want to go to terawatt or 10 terawatt peak uh, per year. It's just not possible. But if you are with the organics, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and so on, you know, you're always, that's enough, right? And it's clear that there's more, and silicon, of course, there's more than enough silicon. So that's great. Um, so this I also showed yesterday. What is the driving force for OBB? is very clear, cost, cost, very cost. Um, so uh, now I will focus a little bit on how things went in the, in the not too far past and, uh, and how the bulk of the junction uh, uh, came to the world. So if you look at early work on, on OBD, then you see that people were inspired either by photosynthesis, uh, by the natural photosynthesis system, and they try something. Uh, and, uh, and they used uh, dyes that were known to be very sturdy dyes. And uh, may, maybe most of you know porphyrins, phthalocyanins, pyrrolines. The pyrrolines are really, uh, especially the pyrrolines diamids, uh, they are very well known dyes. They're pretty good because most red cars, I understand, are painted red with a, with a paint that is based on pyrrolines diamids. Now, red is a difficult color to maintain. Red cars, as you can see, the, usually you can see red cars, they age a little bit faster. That's, that's because red is a really, really difficult color. But purely diamonds do a, good, do a pretty good job. So it's natural that you try to use those kind of materials <coughs> in solar cells as well, neuroscientists. You know, this is also known from, from, uh, from accelerometers. And then the very early uh, solid state OPV uh, uh, devices that were made in the, let's say, 70s and 80s, they were usually Shocky diode, and uh, you have one material with an interface with the metal, and uh, they're very inefficient. They, they were extremely inefficient. A lot of quenching by the metal, of course, and well, a lot of trouble. And of course, there's also a lot of things that people simply didn't know at the time. There were no tricks involved. And all the tricks that we have by now, they didn't exist. Uh, and then uh, you see that from the 70s until 1995. Uh, people used a P-type and an N-type material to put them on top of each other and, uh, and were optimizing that system. Yeah, and uh, that is in, in 85, is this the cell by uh, Yen Tang uh, from Kodak, and he had this uh, silver on a, uh, on a pyrrolene uh, by Yen and a top of thalocyanine, and that on an ITO, and he got something like 0.5% efficiency, which was about five times better than, than ever before. So that tank cell was a real milestone, I would say, in the history of OPV. And uh, you can see why. This is the this is tank's uh, uh, cell. Uh, the top layer, or I don't know it, uh, to, uh, to be honest, I forgot which was the top which is the bottom layer. But let's say one layer was the top of uh, styrene, and the other is the really diamond. So this is from the red uh, paint. And copper styrene is also an interesting material. Uh, that's a very highly colored, very stable material. It was interesting because people, it was discovered in a very simple way, as many discoveries go. You know, people were working with these materials that had these elements, and they were cyanides, and they were putting these cyanides together, and they used copper vessels. 
in the early, early years of the 20th century. They had copper vessels, and they found in these copper vessels, they found this, this residue. There was something was formed, and it was highly colored, and you know, they found out it was reacting with the vessel, and uh, this, uh, how, they, how, how they discovered it. And this really survived everything. So it's a really stable material, beautiful material. And uh, so he put those on top of each other, and here comes the sad story. People were very excited. Only very few groups in the world worked on this, a few groups in Germany mainly. And, uh, and it was very sad, because look at this, 10 years of research, especially in Meissner and Werner groups, and uh, the efficiency, uh, they, were, they wrote the efficiency of 0.5% to 1.2% in 10 years. Yeah, and, and, and really, they didn't get it any further. And then they convinced each other that this was going nowhere. It's very sad. They stopped, basically. They stopped around 95. And 95 was exactly the year where the solution to the problem was, uh, was found, or at least one solution to the problem. What's the problem? Uh, we'll come to that a little bit uh, in a little bit. First, uh, a few things about the materials. Uh, if you have your classical semiconductor, inorganic semiconductor, you have valence band and conduction band with a man gap, and, uh, and so real bands. Eh? Continue. If you have molecules, as you hopefully know, we have molecular orbitals, not too many of them, usually, maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe thousands, but that's about it. And, um, and so, so, so this is not a continuum. All of these orbitals are filled with two electrons, and we have the empty ones here. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital, and this is the lowest occupied molecular orbital. And then, of course, those are the frontier orbitals that are most important in both light absorption and conduction, everything. And the other, other orbitals, I, you can basically forget. Okay, so if you look at elementary processes in OPV, this is the most important slide, of course, for people who look at OPV for the first time. We have to look at what happens in an OPV solar cell, and it's different from what happens in a silicon solar cell. You have light absorption, and you form an exciton, an excited molecule surrounded by a number of other molecules. And in solid state physics, you guys call it an exciton. If it's in solution, it's just an excited molecule. Yeah? But it's very localized. So you can call that a, a columbically bound electron hole pair. For me, as a chemist, is almost nonsense, because it's just an excited molecule. Uh, to call that an electron hole pair, uh, I don't know. Well, anyway, that's how we do this, right? This doesn't do. And then this uh, this excited molecule, uh, this ex this extra excess energy has to travel to the interface of a donor and an acceptor because the, the charges are completely bound. If they don't separate spontaneously, like in silk. So you have to use a second material with a either higher affinity or a lower affinity. We come to that. And then you can have charge separation, charge transfer. This can be whole transfer or electron transfer, depending on which one is exciting. We have formation of a uh, charge transfer complex, maybe, not always. And then the next thing is that you have to charge, separate those charges, and then you get the free charges. The free charges have to dissociate through the, uh, or drift and diffuse through the, uh, the materials and get into the electron. Those are the fundamental steps for presently known organic materials. I use some extra words here for presently known organic materials. I'll come back to that tomorrow afternoon, I think, in my last lecture. Okay? So this is what everybody will teach you. This is how it is. But I add the words for presently known. Okay, so molecular excitations. And so that's an initial photo excited state, it's very localized, tightly bound electron hole pair if you wish, and usually a molecule is not much bigger than a nanometer. If you have a polymer, it's much bigger, but the whole polymer is not in an in excited state. That's, that would be a very bad conception if you think that the whole polymer molecule would be in an excited state. The excited state is very localized on a small fraction of the polymer. The rest of the polymer doesn't know that that part is excited. It's as if you have separate blocks in the polymer. It's not one continuous ideal thing, let alone that there are such things as infinite polymers, obviously, that you learn by theory. Yeah, the real materials are, are quite different. Okay, we have an exciton binding energy of roughly 0.2 to 0.5 EV, and you need, therefore, you would need a huge field to pull those two apart. Right? 
that is just not possible because you would simply burn your solar cell, basically. Yeah? They have a spark, and that's the end of the solar cell. So the exciton has to diffuse to an interface where the true charge separation takes place. Okay. So uh, about this excited state, you know, as you probably know, that there's usually a uh, single excited state. It is a lifetime of a few nanoseconds, something like that. So we have to do all this stuff within a few nanoseconds. You have to get to the charge separated state within a few nanoseconds. For sure, otherwise your, your efficiency will be very low. If you have, want to have an efficiency of, let's say, 99%, you better do this within 10 picoseconds, 100 times faster. Yeah? Something like that. That's a rule of thumb you can think. That's, that you have to be. So, but diffusion is extremely slow. I didn't know, but apparently that's something like with the speed of sound, which is disappointingly slow for me. But that's the way it is. And then, uh, so the exciton, now you can calculate that the exciton diffusion length is something in the order of 10 nanometers. And if you have very high quality crystals, maybe you can get 50 nanometers. But in, in, especially in disordered materials, it's more likely that it's 4 nanometers, something like that. Yeah? So, if you have small molecules, right, and, uh, and that's what I just said, the crystal, and then maybe you get 40, all of them want to be So, only excitations that are closer than 10, 10 nanometers from the interface, they will make it to the interface and they will lead to charge separation. And this is the problem. That is the problem of the present molecular materials. You have limited exciton diffusion lengths and you have initial exciton. Those two problems. You have an exciton, that's a problem. And second, it doesn't live very long. It doesn't get very long. Okay, so now we go back to the tank cell. Here's the tank cell. Uh, and uh, the problem in the tank cell is, therefore, that only at very close to the interface of the two materials you have the area where the excitons make it to the interface. And the rest is a stupid light filter. It just makes the solar cell worse. So, the standard question from uh, the freshman students is, why don't you just make a very thin solar cell? The answer is obvious, it's transparent. Yeah? And a single molecular layer won't give you what you need. So you have to do a trick. Yeah, so now we have to come up with a trick. What is the trick? You can do several tricks. Michael Gretzel did a trick about 20 years ago, which is very similar to the kind of trick that, that, that we did in 1995. The only thing that you have to do is you have to bring the two materials close to each other all over the place. So what you do is you mix them. And this is so trivial now that we say just mix them, and I talked about it yesterday. But I promise you that when I gave talk, and you know, I'm not a physicist, so, I, so in the beginning it was also a little bit difficult for me to talk about solar cell physics. And, uh, but nevertheless, I did uh, here and there, I gave a talk. And I remember vividly to be in Poland, and uh, for a semiconductor physics uh, uh, community, all they knew everything about the inorganic semiconductors, everything. And uh, there was one king of, of, of classical semiconductor physics who was sitting in the front. And apparently a king in Poland in this area. And why did they invite me to give a talk? I think just to have fun on, <laughs> on, on, this, on this stuff. Yeah. So I gave my talk, I talked about the plastic solar cell at that time, it had an efficiency probably of two and a half percent already. So uh, we were absolutely convinced that this stuff works. There was no question, there was no doubt that this solar cell works, okay? But uh, I remember I was at the end of my talk, and then this king of semiconductor physics uh, he raised his hand and says, Well, Dr. Evelyn, but you know that your solar cell can never work. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole community, of course, believed him. Yeah, that was obvious. That was very obvious. I could just leave. Yeah? So then you know that you have an interesting subject. <laughs> okay. okay, anyway. So this was mixing mixing molecules. Huh? So many people said this cannot work because there is no field, there is no depletion layer. There all these concepts that are so central uh, to to uh, to a PN junction, they're all gone. It's just crap. It's a mixture of, of molecules. You know, it's brutal. and conductivity. It's impure. It's disordered. Everything is wrong. Yeah? Everything is wrong. One thing has been solved, the problem of exit on the future. So from now on, you just have to start from that crappy situation in the bottom and try to get it to work, right? Okay. 
Anyway, so by now, hopefully most of you know that what we want to have is we don't want to have a molecular mixture. We want to have a mixture that is just fine enough. The morphology has to be just fine enough that you have that size of the exciton diffusion. So there is no general rule for that size because all the materials have different exciton diffusion lengths. If you have very high diffusion length materials, you might have a morphology of 50 nanometers uh, main size or something. If you have crappy materials, maybe you need to go to down to one or two nanometers, uh, no main size. And then, of course, you want to have bi-continuous interpenetrating network. And you need to have a bi-continuous interpenetrating network because everywhere where you develop the charges, you want to have the possibility for the two charges to find their way to their electrode. And, uh, of course, this is uh, sometimes a little bit difficult, but I always do with the parents of the chemistry students. I, I talk to the, chemi to the parents of the chemistry students and say, I can explain what bi-continuous interpenetrating networks is. It's a difficult concept. Huh? So what you do, you close your eyes, you imagine red chicken wire, and then now imagine that you weave blue chicken wire through it. Voila, done. That's a bi-continuous interpenetrating network. Blue and red are always next to each other. So, but of course, there are thousands of morphologies that you can think of. We'll talk about them later. Donors and acceptors now in energy. So if I talk, if I if I do this, what do I mean? This is the vacuum level for an electron. This is the energy scale vertical. And we have the two 40 fraction orbitals of the donor and two uh, fraction orbitals of the acceptor. How do I know that one is the donor and the other acceptor? Very simple. Because if this is higher than that, then this is the donor, that's the acceptor. Very simple. So you can have a strong donor acceptor couple. Here, the homo of this donor is even above the lumo of the acceptor. So you don't need light in the dark, boom, electron transfer. Sodium and chlorine. Yeah, it's just a stupid chemical reaction. Okay? That's what it is. An electron transfer. Now, if you have them not so far apart, but they are in this special situation where this homo is up in between the homo and the lumo, then we are in the world where we to be, we excite, for example, the donor. Now you have this singlet excited state, and now if these total molecules are close, this one can jump over to that one. And uh, we have photon electron transfer. In the case that the acceptor is excited, we have singlet uh, 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 excited acceptor here, and of course you can have uh, that this electron jumps over here, or for the physicist that the hole jumps from here to there. Uh, I cannot work with holes. I can only work with electrons. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I get used to you guys. It's okay. <laughs> That's okay. As long as you respect my electrons, it's fine. <laughs> okay, anyway. So, thermodynamics and kinetics. And so, this electron transfer is, of course, uh, one of the key steps in the whole process. If this doesn't work very well, then forget it. And if it works very well, then at least you have a good start. So, um, you can look at this in the way of kinetics, and you can look at this in the way of energetics. Yeah. So, that's the tip, that's thermodynamics, kinetics. So, uh, two uh, central uh, things are the Weller equation and Marcus uh, equation, Marcus Thiele, and Marcus got his uh, Nobel Prize for this work. Uh, so, if you want to talk in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, energy, then you go to the Weller equation, and so if you have a, a Gibbs free energy of the, of the star separated state, you can describe it in terms of the oxidation and reduction potential of the two materials. Then there's a separation term, how far are the two charges apart. And of course, the, the environment, the solvation in solution, and the environment plays, the polarizability of the environment, and so on, plays a big role. Yeah? So this is, of course, that's the value. And Marcus is very interesting. Yeah? I mean, he got a Nobel Prize because he, he predicted something which was kind of a little bit of counterintuitive. And that's why of course, we, you know, people like it more if it works. And uh, so the, uh, the story there is that the Gibbs activation energy of the charge transfer uh, is a combination, is, is built out of a combination of the, the, uh, the, the, the energy difference going to the excited the, um, uh, just separated state and the reorganization energy. The reorganization energy is an impor very important thing. Reorganization energy is really interesting. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about it tomorrow on the joint project that, uh, that Sean and I did. Um, but um, reorganization is clear uh, for me, intuitively, it's clear that you want to have with energy transfer, with electron transfer, and with charge 
um, migration, you want to have as little uh, of a reorganization energy as, as you can. It, I think it's obvious. Uh, if, a mo if, if you have molecular conduction, is that, let's say one molecule has an extra electron, and it has to hop from one molecule to another. If a molecule uh, takes a very different shape when it has an extra electron, then every molecule has to change the shape while that electron is moving, which is a horrible situation, you know? So, I'll come back to that. So, what are famous donors? Famous donors are polymers, conducting polymers. Uh, PPVs, polythiophenes, this is called coxithiophenes, polyacylthiophenes, polyperols, small molecules, TTF, or these. Uh, Diamino, aryl amino compounds, uh, ferrocene, uh, here you have your, your, your complexes, uh, either gallocyanines or other porphyrins. <coughs> then we have the neurocyanines and the green nephridons. Those are, let's say, examples of, of uh, usually quite stable materials. Some of these materials are really stable, some of the polymers, of course, are not stable, but that's something we learn and we can improve. And then acceptors, all uh, naturally. You have uh, benzoquinone, uh, and then if you want to make it a little bit stronger, you make this tetracycline derivative of this benzoquinone, TC and Q. If you want to have a little, little bigger pi conjugated system in order to absorb a little bit more light, you have to put some extra rings on it, extended TC and Q is an alternative. You can also put electron withdrawing groups on your regular polymers that makes all the orbital energies go down, so relatively that becomes and there is C60. And uh, you will hear more about C60 than you like from me. And then uh, there's a derivative of C60, which is PCB, and that you have already heard quite a bit about, and then I will babble about in an hour from now. Uh, then we have acceptors, uh, the pyrrolein diimides. This is with two metal groups, but of course you can put anything on those nitrogen atoms. Uh, you can do it slightly differently than uh, this kind of compound. You can also put electron withdrawing groups on the molecules that I just showed you as donors, but now that we've got to have electron uh, withdrawing groups, they become acceptors. Here are some beryllium salts, uh, uh, is met metal biologian, and here is uh, again this pyrrolin diimide, but then I have a series for you. This is by Klaus Müller group in the Max Planck Institute in Germany for polymer portion. Um, and they make it more extended, more extended in order to cover to absorb a broader spectrum of the solar light. And then you have people that dream of making stacks of molecules, and then this, these molecules would sit as coins on top of each other and have a, have a good conductivity in the stack, and then you have these kinds of molecules. People have designed all kinds of things. And the early commonly used polymers that did most of the early work was in the beginning was NEHPPV, methoxy ethyl PPV. And, uh, but this was never made on a large scale. It, was, it came from Santa Barbara and from Fred Hoodle's group, but uh, he never got it on. A, he never made it on a real large scale. And that's, of course, a, a disadvantage, especially with polymers, because you have a batch-to-batch -batch variation in quality, which is incredible. So you, if you work with solar cells, and you work with solar cells, and you get your MEHPV from Mr. A and that one from Mrs. B, and you cannot compare your results, which was a horrible situation. So this was ended in a big project uh, that uh, uh, Philips was involved with, and Philips was working at that time of, on polymer light emitting diodes. And so they worked on many PPVs because these PPVs, they shine like crazy and they luminesce beautifully. That's really great stuff. And so they had this MDMO PPV, or OC1C10 PPV. This is methoxy, uh, methoxy dimethyl dimethyl octyl oxy MDMO PPV. And this stuff, uh, they had, I think they had it made by somebody else, but they, uh, they had a kilo. This was great. The world had a kilogram batch, one quality of a polymer. And then all the groups that were active at that moment, they shared this stuff, and everybody was working, and we could compare each other's results. That was great. That's, what, that's the only reason that everybody used MDMO. Because there are about a hundred reasons not to use MD <laughs> It's incredibly unstable. It forms a gel in any sol uh, solvents. Uh, Sean knows all about that. 
And uh, you know, it's, it's, you had to steer it in the beginning. The, the recipe was, I think, that you had to steer it overnight or something before you had a reasonable solution. But then probably it was almost gone already by oxidation or whatever. <laughs> it's a horrible. Yeah. And then in the soda cell, it was even worse because you know the morphology was stable unless it was in the sun. Then the morphology was not. <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. so horrible. That was the times that we were talking about solar cells and said, that, well, these solar cells, they give a little bit of energy, but the moment you can get most energy out of these solar cells is by burning them. <laughs> okay, those times are over. Um, now, and then came, uh, and then came, or there was already, but then on stage came polyhexyl regular, uh, regio regular polyhexyl type of PCHD. And that has really been the workhorse. And it's still, if you go to a conference, you still hear about 100 talks about P3 HD. So it's really important, and we have learned a lot, although it is not typical. There is no typical polymer yet for a plastic solar cell, because there couldn't be a bit of difference between a solar cell made from this first workhorse and the second workhorse. They're totally different. Everything is different. So it's, uh, and, 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 and of course with new polymers we will have different stuff again. It's very difficult to, uh, to find. So, but this is uh, the standard uh, following except for PCBM. I will talk about that after the break. And PCBM and its bigger brother, 70 PCBM, they have been uh, the acceptor in all world record solar cells until last year. But in, and since last year there are also other derivatives of C60 that are in there. But um, the distilled fullerenes are in all uh, world record sources. Um, so you see slowly uh, the record going up, and uh, and with uh, 70 pcb, the last few years all, most of the records were done with 70 pcb. For a simple reason, that 70 pcb absorbs much more of the light. <coughs> so I'll, I'll show you later. Well, here's, here it is already. Here are uh, uh, let's say normalized. Uh, the absorption spectra of uh, 60 pcbm, 70 pcbm, and also 84 pcbm. Well, if you ever want to make a cheap solar cell, never use a C84 pcbm. It's more <laughs> expensive than, than well, na you name it, diamond. Yeah, I'm not lying. It's probably more expensive than diamond. Yeah. So it's just ridiculous. But for academic purposes, we made some 84 pcbm, and uh, we had some fun with it. Um, so here are the absorption spectra. As you can see, the absorption spectra on, on, this, on this scale of 60 pcbm is really a lot less than that of 70 pcbm. But you also see that they both end exactly at the same position. The optical band gap for these two materials is identical, which is kind of interesting. I'm not going into that, but it has great advantages because you can use a mixture of these two with many polymers. And that makes the cost situation of organic solar cells a lot more interesting. Um, but nevertheless, and then when you have 84, that's the next following, then you have you see that this never ends. It goes like you have a band gap of, uh, of 0.5 dB or something. It's really horrible. So it's no no good. So the only two interesting followings are C60 and C70 and the mostly used materials this year. And then, of course, everything started in a very different way. There was no start with the, the discovery of a solar cell. The discovery of the, of the plastic solar cell starts with a quenching. It starts with a quenching experiment. If you add C60 to any luminescent polymer, it's dead. It's completely packed. You know, you just add a little bit, dead. It's beautiful. And uh, there, was a, there were a few groups that, uh, that were interested in this, and they looked at it, and one group said this is uh, just quenching by energy transfer, and the other group said this is quenching by electron transfer. And so the Santa Barbara group was the one that said uh, we have charges, yeah? we have electron transfer. And that was the right, uh, that was the right interpretation. And uh, so this was the discovery of photoreduced electron transfer from a conjugated polymer to an acceptor, which is full, uh, in this case C60. And um, at that time, it was clear you quenched the luminescence by a factor of 1,000. 
So you know it's an ultra-fast process because it must be something in the order of a thousand times faster than the uh, singlet lifetime, so it's around one picosecond, which is pretty fast. So everybody was happy with the picosecond until uh, a little bit later, in 2001, uh, with ultra-fast laser spectroscopy, a lot of experience was done in cooperation with an Italian group, and it was found that the forward electron transfer rate, in this case, is 40 femtoseconds, which is faster than the natural synthesis process. So it was, uh, I think, kind of amazing, and it really explains why the efficiency of this process is so high, because if the process goes within 40 femtoseconds, then nothing else can beat it. So you must have a very high efficiency. And that's the beauty of high, of high speed. Okay, so this, uh, uh, I'll come back to this later because this picture is more complicated than that. So, you have the, the basic processes in PV cell light absorption. Let's, let's have the polymer absorb the light. We have an exciton that, that travels uh, either in the polymer chain or from chain to chain until you come close to a C60 molecule. Then you have charge uh, separation. The electron has to hop in the C60 domain or the CDF domain to one electron and the hole has to hop either in the chain or chain to chain until it goes to the other electron. And, and then, of course, this whole picture is completely wrong because you have a much finer morphology for that electron. Yeah, so that's basically another picture. Um, okay, another intimate cell. A little bit more about the polymers. Because maybe some of you can use a little bit more info about the polymers. So, this uh, starts, uh, conjugated polymers, the, the, the conducting polymer story started with polyacetylene, which gave a Nobel Prize to, uh, to uh, the guys who worked with it. Uh, polyacetylene is really named after acetylene, this is acetylene, and if you polymerize that in one or another way, then you get polyacetylene. And uh, so it's a strictly alternating uh, chain of uh, single and double bonds if you draw it like this. And this is a a simple way of polyacetylene. You can draw it in different ways. There are many forms, but um, this is, let's say, the most simple uh, uh, form that you can find. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, well, you're only recording, so that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so, so here are the three discoveries of the fact: not that you have a conjugated polymer and that it conducts, because these conjugated polymers they are lousy conductors. They are intrinsic semiconductors, not, there's nothing in it so they don't work. So the discovery was if you dope them, wow, if you dope them, then they start conducting. If, if I tell you now, then you think, oh, boring. But you know, but at that time, that was, the difference was a factor, I think, 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 or something. So a dramatic uh, 7 or the magnitude upon oxidation with iodine, this stuff increases in, uh, in conductivity. And I tell you that if you, and later on people made better polyacetylene, uh, and uh, it, it is not so trivial. And this is very complicated and also very, very powerful stuff. Because if you really know what you're doing and you make the, the world record polyacetylene with high dope and so on and so on, it conducts like copper. You know, it really does. And so it's, I mean, it's amazing stuff. Uh, and you can make, uh, if you wish, you can have super from Okay, so let's go a little bit. This, we built this up as chemists. We built this up from the simplest building block, which is uh, ethane. Ethene, sorry. That's, that's the language problem. Uh, so this is uh, one double, uh, two carbons, one double bond. Sp2 hybridized. Sp2 hybridized meaning that you have this sigma orbital between the two carbons is uh, the same kind of orbital that you have to the two hydrogen atoms. They are all sp2 hybridized, and then you have one p orbital that has not been uh, hybridized, so it's, it's left over. That's one p orbital from this carbon and one p orbital from that carbon, and they can they are orthogonal to the other orbitals, and these can form this pi orbital, the pi bond between two p atomic p orbitals. Um, Okay, so it, there's of course a binding and an anti-binding combination, and you have a PZ orbital of atom 1 and a PZ orbital of atom 2. You have the binding combination that will give you this energy, where of course both electrons will sit in this orbital, and you have the anti-binding orbital. In, in, in orbital, uh, let's say, uh, more like a, a orbital shape uh, 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 picture, it looks like this. Here we still have green and, and blue, meaning that the, 
the quantum mechanical uh, uh, sign of the phase, so it's a plus and a minus sign. And uh, so this is the binding combination, and this is the anti binding combination. Okay, so if we do that, this uh, here at the left, we have uh, ethene, and uh, so we have the binding combination and the anti binding combination. There's not much more, and this is in the same time, this is the homo, and this is the lumo, so this is your optical gap or your gap, man gap, if you wish. Now, if you make uh, two of them, then we get, of course, four orbitals, of which the two ones here are occupied and those are not occupied. If we take six, then obviously we get three orbitals that are filled and three orbitals that are not filled. And what do you see? You see that the more orbitals we get, the more in energy space we take up. So, the, the, as you can see, the, this optical gap or the band gap becomes smaller and smaller. It doesn't go to necessarily to zero. It's not impossible. There's one development but usually it doesn't, but it becomes smaller. So if you have a real, let's say, very long and then nice, theoretically stretched and uh, perfect molecule, then you would have uh, something like a, a band. A band, uh, again, a valence band in the production band. But don't forget, it's still a molecule. No matter if it would have some truth in it, that it would be a one-dimensional situation of a band gap, it's still a molecule, meaning that everything is still localized inside the molecule. Yeah. So it's a very, very important uh, difference. And people in the beginning, they were thinking, if I bring this to zero, I have a metal. Boom. Yeah, but of course that's not true, because it's only zero inside the molecule, and between molecules, that's a, you have to hop the charges, so it's not really a metal. Uh, what, uh, what people usually do not show you is the shape of molecular orbitals, this, uh, how they look. And what you see in many books is how molecular orbitals are being uh, made. This is butadiene. Let me go back. Butadiene is this one. This is butadiene. Yeah, four carbon atoms, two double bonds. So in, if you have four carbon atoms, you can make four combinations. Here are your four levels. Here are the two occupied levels. Here are the two unoccupied levels. And this is how the quantum mechanical signs are. And if you now, these are your starting molecules, of course, the, the, the orbitals, your atomic orbitals. But that is not how it looks with the molecular orbital. The molecular orbital looks like this. I always call them bananas. And then these, you have these bananas here. Now this is, um, um, uh, you have to be a little bit careful, this is not this one. I'm talking, what are the most important ones? This one is not interesting at all. This one is interesting because this is our homo, and this one is interesting because this is our lumo. That's what we have to look at. So if we look at this homo, and I just give you the, the wave function, then it looks like this. Yeah? And then you still see the quantum mechanical signs. If I square it, now I get to uh, the probability of finding the electron somewhere in space, and it has this shape. And then, of course, it's just it's probable to find it up or under, above or under the plane of the molecule. So this is, uh, this is the shape with the bananas uh, of the butadiene. <coughs> Uh, homo, and here you see that the lumo has the banana over where we usually draw a single bond here. When we draw a single bond here, which is very right, for, I mean, that's what you should do. But in the lumo, you see that this, it looks like there is a bonding interaction there. And this is something which is universally true. Uh, that you find this kind of situation, that, that you find the bananas in the, in the homo and this bananas on the wrong spot in Lumo. So let me show you. I have here your hexatriene. This is the homo of the, the, of the uh, hexatriene, and this is the Lumo. Again, you find the bananas where we draw the single one. This is how it is. And if you square them, of course, then everything is green. There's not much, much uh, difference. And if I make a very long one, there's a, this is a saffron-like chain. This, I think, is C12, or uh, a little bit more C. 16 chain, and uh, so now when you look at the homo, you see the bananas here, all the bananas, and here you see the bananas in the lumo that are in the wrong spot, but you see also something else. Already here, in this short molecule, you see that the density and the, the probability of finding the electron in this orbital is bigger in the middle than on the sides. On the sides, it dies out a little bit. So it's not like, if you have a very long molecule, you, uh, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not one nucleality. Um, 
And this is very important with respect to the size of an exciton and the size of a polar arm, and so on and so on. They are not extended over a whole polar. Anyway, now you know, this is one orbital, let eh? be very careful. This is one orbital, the Lumo and the Homo. This is one orbital, and in this whole complex orbital, there are two electrons. Yeah? And, and, and I hope everybody knows that they don't have to hop from one banana to another or something. Right? That is quantum mechanics. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay. So you get these polymers, and we have all kinds of polymers nowadays. Eh? In the old uh, times, it started with people that tried, Fred Brunel again, uh, they tried to make polymers with zero bend, yeah, but they did very smart tricks. And uh, one trick is uh, to add extra rings, and this is uh, in this PI uh, uh, ATM, and this has a band gap of only one EV, which is a really small band gap yeah, for all for again for the mechanics, because it's already too small. It's, uh, Polyacetylene is 1.5. Polythiophene is regular. Polythiophene has something in the order of 1.9. And the PPVs are a little bit wide. They are 2.1, uh, sorry, or more. And it, it never use uh, a series of uh, truly aromatic rings because then you get wide benefits. There's another problem. This polymer is not flat. One ring is almost orthogonal to the next ring. So you have zero overlap. So it's great. For us, that's so how do we do band gap engineering? Is uh, well, you can do band gap engineering. You can design polymers with band gaps in several ways. We have several chemical tricks to do that, design tricks to do that. And uh, I must say, a little bit disappointingly, almost everybody uses the same trick. And this is not necessarily wise that the whole community that works on OPV uses only one of the tricks to make uh, to make certain band gap homes, because. Maybe we are in the wrong area. Maybe we should try the other ones. I'm not saying it is wrong, I'm just saying maybe. So one trick is to take to take two building blocks. And now without trying to confuse you, one building block is a donor and the other is an acceptor. But not in terms that we talked about earlier. I just mean that the the, the homo and rumo again are a little bit higher of the monomer with that I call D, and the other one is a monomer that I call R. Now I just bring them in one molecule, so now the whole thing gives one new, uh, well, a whole set of new molecular orbitals. It's not two molecules, but they are they become one molecule. So in this, if you combine these four orbitals in one molecule, what is your new homo and your new lumo? This is the new homo, and this is the new lumo, and this is a very simplistic picture, but uh, you know, it's a start of work. You can see that if you take one that, uh, that is a donor and one that is an acceptor, then the homo from the donor and the lumo from the acceptor, they form a new term, so now you have a small neck. And this, of course, you can do because you can play with it, you can, you can add different side groups that, play, that bring this up and down, and so on, so you can just make it that the right combination that your new homo and lumo situation is perfect. Yeah? Uh, that, that's a very common trick. And people, I, there's no trial and error in this anymore. I mean, the good chemists, the good polymer chemists can do this perfectly. There's no, there's no doubt about it. That's not the, the art anymore. Okay, so here are some examples. And so you have, have typically the donor part. This is uh, fluorine. Not fluorine at all, but fluorine uh, moiety, which is relatively a donor kind of a moiety. And here we have this complex uh, molecule building block. This is the relative to the acceptor. And they have put thiophenes in between in order to allow the molecule to be flat. That's all. And here is also another donor acceptor and with, uh, with the thiophenes here. It is uh, the immediately donor acceptor, donor next one. Uh, here you have uh, donor acceptor and donor. Uh, here you have donor acceptor. You know, all these molecules have the same thing. So uh, let me uh, let me uh, uh, forget this. I want to uh, end uh, this uh, little session with uh, an important thing, and that is that you have photoinduced electron transfer. I talked about that photoinduced electron transfer. You uh, absorb a photon in the donor. The donor is excited. The electron goes over there. The electron goes from the lumo of the donor to the lumo of the acceptor, and from there it can go through to the cathode. And of course, the hole goes here. 
for, uh, for me as a chemist the electron goes there. Uh, this is the uh, electron transfer, but uh, just as well. Am I late? Oops! <laughs> time to stop? Did you do? What did you do? <laughs> okay, well maybe this would be a good time to. Wow! This is incredible. You you have you have good done time to take our break. We'll be back about uh, two twenty-five. Yeah. <laughs>